everybody. Today we're reading chapter 42, Standing with Lincoln. The civil rights leaders were human, and so there were rivalries and jealousies. They disagreed among themselves. Those from older organizations, like the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, were at their best working through the courts and trying to change the laws. That was a slow process. It took skilled leadership. The lawyer, Third Thurgood Marshall and the labor chief A. Philip Randolph were the were that kind of leader. Martin Luther King Jr. had helped organize the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Its appeal was to the mass of moderate church-going blacks. Most of its leaders were ministers, but many young people were impatient with both of these approaches, which seemed too slow-moving. They formed the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee. The, N the SNCC, which people pronounced as SNCC. SNCC and the Congress for w Racial Equality, CORE, organized many of the sit-ins in college communities. Some black groups wanted to fight with fists, weapons, and anger. Everyone knew that if they got their way, much of the high purpose of the civil rights movement would be lost. Leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. had made civil rights a cause for all Americans. It was about equality. It was about justice and freedom for all. It wasn't just for blacks, although most of the leadership was black. For years, A. Philip Randolph had talked of a freedom rally in the nation's capital. Perhaps it would bring the diverse black leaders together. Perhaps it would bring black and white people together. Perhaps it would influence Congress. President Kennedy had sent a civil rights bill to Congress. Would it be passed? No one was sure. A march would show Congress and the President the importance of the civil rights movement. Many thought that Kennedy was paying more attention to the affairs in Cuba and Vietnam than to the problem of unfairness at home. When President Ken Kennedy gave a speech in West Berlin, Germany, about political freedom, it inspired cheers from people around the world. In this picture, a protester pra practicing passive resistance is carried away by police during a core demonstration. And in this picture over here, President Kennedy stands on a platform to survey the Berlin Wall. But some Americans weren't enthusiastic. They knew there was a kind of freedom that was missing right here in America. Exactly 100 years had passed since Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Some white people were still telling black people to be patient. Martin Luther King Jr. said, We cannot wait any longer. Now is the time. A. Philip Randolph was 74. If ever he was to have his march, it had to be soon. And so it was decided. On August 28th, 1963, there would be a march for freedom in Washington, D.C. Black leaders hoped that 100,000 people would participate. The marchers were going to demand four things. Passage of the Civil Rights Bill, integration of schools by year's end, an end to job discrimination, and a program of job training. Bayard Rustin, who was a whiz at organizing, was in charge. Rustin got to work. He had 21 drinking fountains, 24 first aid stations, and lots of portable toilets set up on Washington's grassy mall. Workers made 80,000 cheese sandwiches. Movie stars, singers, high school bands, preachers, and politicians practiced speeches and songs. The speakers and entertainers were to stand on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and look toward the tall, slender Washington Monument, and beyond that, to the nation's capital. 2,000 buses headed for Washington, and 21 chartered trains. 60,000 whites came. Television crews high in the Washington Monument guessed that there were 250,000 people altogether. It was a day filled with song and hope and goodwill. Finally, in the late afternoon, the last of the speakers stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It was Martin Luther King, Jr., he began with a prepared speech, which was formal and dignified, as was his nature. Then something happened inside him. Perhaps he responded to the crowd. Perhaps his training as a preacher took over. Whatever it was, 
he left his written speech and began talking from his heart i have a dream he said i have a dream that one day down in alabama little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands and with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers i have a dream today in this picture up here marcus held hands and sang we shall overcome in this larger one it says more than twenty two hundred and fifty thousand people including sixty thousand whites gathered in washington d c to demand an end to racial inequality in america this picture over here says dr king's powerful words were heard across the country and up here it says see page three hundred and thirty one for the complete text of martin luther king's martin luther king jr's i have a dream speech and this one over here says we shall overcome became the anthem of the civil rights movement the song is said to have originated in the 1940s at Tennessee's Highlander Folk School, where black textile workers gathered together. The lyrics for the song are, We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome some day. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome some day.